Nature's wealth, good for your health. This is the Raw Life Health Show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Raw Life Health Show. I got a wonderful guest today. His name is Dr. Spendalelius. And uh, he's a, a great guy. He's a raw foodist. He's on a raw vegan diet now for seven years, but he's been a vegetarian even longer. And we're going to discuss that today. So we're going to call him Doc because it's much easier to say that. So hello, <laughs> Doc. Welcome to the show. How are you? Well, good morning and good afternoon for you. Uh, I do appreciate you bringing me on the show. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, day. Well, uh, uh, so you've been on a raw vegan diet for seven years now. Now, is that 100%? Oh, yes, 100%. Absolutely. Um, I decided it was actually in 2015. Well, I think, as I mentioned to you before, I became a vegetarian in 1981. And then I became a raw vegan in 1991. And, you know, there can be very bad vegans out there, <laughs> very bad diets. So I decided around 2015 to that I knew it was the healthiest way. One of the great, best documentaries I've ever seen was uh, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. All right, where he does this. And so I wanted to start teaching my patients about that. So in 2015, I became a raw vegan. I was a raw vegan for seven months. And then my family came and visited for Christmas. <laughs> and we had a vegan meal and I shared it with them. And by April of the following year, 2016, I went to my wife and I said, I, I'm, I'm done. I just feel dense. And I said, I felt so good under a raw vegan. So uh, since April of 2016, that's been it. So, um, before we move forward, how, what kind of doctor are you? I'm a naturopathic doctor. Okay, great. And we're going to hear about your practice later. But so how was your diet and your, your health prior to going on a raw vegan diet? Oh, oh gosh. Okay, well, I have always, especially since I was a child, um, I was very prone to sinus issues, you know, bronchial issues. I was one of those kids in school when he got a cold, his nose got super crusty and red and raw and one of those embarrassed little kids. And it was just that way for most of my life. And then, as I mentioned, in 1981, I became a vegetarian and I noticed a significant change in my health, but there was still dairy. And it took me 10 years to give up that opiate kind of <laughs> addiction, you know, giving up cheese. So in 1991, I became a vegan and this other huge quantum leap in my health. But I noticed that with vegetarian and then vegan, I would reach this plateau of health and it wouldn't go any further. So vegetarian went here, vegan went here. And then I decided by night, by 2016, as I said, to permanently go raw vegan. The, the thing is, and I can say this in all honesty, and I have a lot of patients that also would agree, I had this quantum leap in health and it hasn't plateaued yet. My wife and I, when we lived up in Shasta County, we would have one meal a day. That's all we would eat. And before we'd have that meal, we would go hike up to about 8,000 feet on Mount Shasta and then come down and have our meal. That's how much energy and more efficient the body is when you're a raw vegan. People don't understand that. It's hard to describe a feeling that somebody's never felt, but... I mean, I, 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 I only look at it as like, I know how they feel because I live their lifestyle. It's just always feeling like you've just eaten a big meal and you can hardly move. And now it's like, I get so much done. I feel so light on my feet, but I feel so satisfied. It's amazing. Oh, it it's, it, we have made sure it's always been a rule with my medical practice that if you come to me with a chronic condition, now, yeah, we treat boo-boo toes. And if you have a cold or flu, those are acute. But if you come to me with a chronic condition, cancer, Lyme, lupus, multiple sclerosis, you know, the list goes on and on. You come to me with a chronic condition. Part of the requirement of my treating you is you have to go vegan for the term of the program. And when you're a cancer patient, you have to go if not 100%, you have to go really close to 100, close to 100% raw vegan. And it's interesting, we've been very, very blessed in our working with cancer patients. We have a very high success rate working with them. And yet, out of 10 new cancer patients that'll show up, seven will never come back after their first visit because they can't make that connection in their brain, diet versus their health. And unfortunately, so many doctors today are telling their patients diet has nothing to do with their cancer. And that's, and it's a sad thing to say. It's really crazy. But you know, 
I'm thinking of my loved ones. My, I have a, a family member who just I hadn't seen in years, but uh, she has cancer. Her husband has cancer, and they came down to visit me. Uh, for years, they never wanted to eat anywhere close to where I eat, but now they got cancer, and it's serious, so and that maybe they'll make a change. But I, I, I was even willing to compromise and taking them to a, a healthy fast food restaurant like Chipotle or something. <laughs> right. And they're like, we don't want to go there. We just want to go get ice cream at McDonald's. I gotcha. And now I've been doing this a long time, helping people and talking about this a long time. I sent my own mother the astaxanthin. Have you used astaxanthin yet? The the astaxanthin by Velasta? No, have not. Okay, I, we got to talk about this. But I sent this to my mom because this works for cancer, arthritis, and everything. She wouldn't even take it. And it's just... What's I, I have another friend who has lung cancer. I, I mean, not lung cancer. He, he just got put on oxygen. And regardless of diet, yeah. they told him don't smoke. And he got out of hospital. And what's he did? He smoked. I I know uh, it's 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 sad to see it, but it's but I think one of the and I'm going to say this in a strange sort of way. One of the weird benefits I have of being a traditional naturopathic doctor is most of the time that patients come to me with serious chronic issues. I'm the last resort. So they're desperate by that point. So those that do make the commitment to, to the program tend to do very, very well. They may not always be happy with it because they have to do a candy to cleanse first. Then we treat the presenting complaints that they show up with. But it's that, and it's sad to say, but it's that desperation, it's that fear that they finally go, I have no other choices. All right, I'll try it. And sure. uh, I've seen cancer patients go from stage four to zero. I've seen, uh, we're actually listed with Lyme.org because we've been so successful. I've seen patients spend $70,000 for Lyme treatments and get nowhere. And we treat it with, with the holistic medications, but also with diet and lifestyle choices. And we see great success and so much. And I try to tell people, I have this little pie chart that shows the the three factors of healing, the the medications, diet, and attitude. And that in it's been proven that attitude and diet are such a huge part of it. Now, when you say medications, uh holistic herbs. Ho even holistic. You talk about herbs, are you talking about uh that, that is correct. That homopathy is correct. or just just herbs? I'm sorry, say it again. You talk about just herbs, herb, herb, herbs. Well, they're herbal combinations, formulas. We develop them as well as we also work with Dr. Christopher's uh, herbs a, great, quite a bit great. too. Wonderful. Yeah, Wonderful. but one of our absolute, absolute most dynamic herbs that we have ever worked with, uh, we actually learned about it from Johns Hopkins University of all places. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but uh, Thunder God Vine Root. No, no. Wow. Oh, if you would like, I'll send you some information on it. Johns Please. Hopkins did a five, Johns Hopkins <laughs> did a five year trial study on Thunder God root. It comes from China. It's been over there for used about 400 years and Germany got hold of it. Johns Hopkins. It is the exact Johns Hopkins. This is their clinical trial study found that it was the exact replacement for methotrexate, which is a chemotherapy drug. It causes cancer cells to go into apoptosis that basically shuts them down. It, they commit suicide. And uh, it's been incredibly remarkable. Thunder God Vine Root has been amazing. Wow, wow. So let's get back to your story. So you go on this raw diet. Now you're married. Is your wife on a raw vegan diet as well? She's probably, a, she's been vegan for uh, quite a number of years. She's probably 50, 75% raw. Sure. And how is that uh, uh, living with somebody as you as 100% <laughs> raw and them not? Because this is something people always I gotcha. ask. So how, how, how is it? You're absolutely correct. It's even worse when you're with a partner who's not even vegan. That gets to be quite difficult. My wife does an awful lot raw, but she's, an, uh, she's a country gal from Alabama, and um, she's very flexible in her her attitudes and what she does. She absolutely loves, I do a lot of my own prepping, but because I also work with patients and things like that, and I go to Guatemala and I do medical volunteering down there, she is more than happy to do um, a very large amount of the prepping. She enjoys it. This is something she enjoys doing. So I've been very blessed. I totally know that there are couples that this doesn't work. 
Sure, sure. Well, say that again. You you totally know what. Um, I understand that uh, there are a lot of couples that this just doesn't work. Got it, you, got it, you, got it. So oh, yeah. what about, do you think the raw food diet ultimately is for everyone or ultimately? Okay. Great question. Great question. Because I have, had, <laughs> I've been a doctor over 20, 24 years and I don't even try to keep count of the number of patients who come in and go, and this is just veganism, not raw. Oh, I tried to do it and I got sick. And I went, no, you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. And I said, what you did was you got you went into a detox. And if you had just stuck with it, you probably would have got past it. So raw can be a very significant detox if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so I'm not just a doctor. I'm also a, a nutritionist. So I try to guide patients through it slowly. If they're elderly, if they're older, I'm more slow. If they're younger, they're in their 20s or 30s, they tend to be able to just burn right into it. I'll be honest with you, okay? And I know a lot of people won't like this and you probably will not get, <laughs> I don't know what your your thread is gonna be comments after this. Human beings, and I could go into an hour's detail of why humans are, are herbivores. All right, I could go into an hour just from the medical point of view. I mean, this is stuff I got in med school. Um, humans are naturally herbivores. Yes. I'm going to give you the the extreme answer. I believe in the long haul, if done correctly, raw vegan works for everyone. It's just that it's going to be hard for some and not as difficult for others. It's it's a process. And you know, there's there I've seen these medical uh, trial studies that in the fatty parts of your body, as well as in the brain, the reproductive organs, we can hold drugs that we had taken pharmaceuticals 40 years ago. And when whenever you put someone on a cleanse or a fast, you're aware of this, especially with their age. They can actually, during a cleanse, can re-release drugs they took 40 years ago. So they think it's the cleanse and it's the the crap that they took over yep. their lifetime. Exactly. And so it has to be a gentle process. Exactly. So you've been a doctor all these years. What, uh, how was your practice before you found out about vegan and raw vegan? Was it uh, like how well, I'll, dramatically? Well, I'll be blessed with you. I was a vegan before I became a doctor. Yeah. Okay. okay. You are. Okay. Yeah. I was a vegan before I became a doctor. I was actually a software engineer back in the early nineties. And then I became a doctor in the late nineties. I was already a vegan. My point was I became vegan out of compassion, you know, because I love all life. And um, now the health benefits were a wonderful bonus <laughs> and it was really remarkable, but I was already a vegan at the time. So how long have you been a vegan now? Since 1991. Okay. And how about you personally? I mean, I'm sure you monitor your blood work because you're a doctor, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, so I, how, how's your health been since you went vegan? Any issues at all? Nope. It have been absolutely amazing. I've checked for, you know, out of curiosity because my patients, they want to know, you know, you know, the old thing, you know, doctor heal thyself. A lot of doctors are bad patients. I've been a bad patient in the past. Um, I check my blood, my blood sugars. Uh, my health is perfect. Absolutely perfect. And that's another thing. And I know a lot of people may not like this, but it, for doctors, especially younger doctors who work in a clinical environment, the national average is they get sick about once a week because you're exposed to all this. Before I went raw vegan, I would every morning before I would go in the clinic and I would do it about two hours so I would be okay, I would take about three cloves of fresh garlic, crush them up and swallow them <laughs> so that I would have this sulfur benefit, you know, antibiotic, so to speak, benefit, uh, anti-infective protecting me. And I would still get sick about once a year or so, mostly like a cold, but very, very mild. And then I went raw. And I've never got sick again after that, you know, going into the clinics because bacteria has to have mucus to feed on. And a raw vegan diet is a very low mucus diet. Now, on your own personal raw diet, uh, do you include uh, raw recipes or are you somebody that's just strictly fruits and vegetables? No, no, I have recipes. Absolutely. I wrote a book called the, uh, it's, it's actually on Amazon called How to Cure Chronic Diseases with a Raw Vegan Diet. And it's got about 300 recipes in wow. it. Wow. So I absolutely adore fruits and vegetables, but I love wild rice. 
because you can soak it. It's the only rice that you can soak. And it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I make so many, my wife as well, make so many raw dishes that use rice. And it's very satisfying. Yeah, I went to a, a, a raw vegan restaurant in California years ago called Alok. And okay. they made a lot of recipes with the wild rice and oh, yeah. uh, really amazing stuff. Yeah, we soak it for about 24 to 48 hours. And that also releases about 80% of the arsenic that's in it. Uh, so most of the arsenic is gone by the time you're done. It's very fulfilling. And, but uh, so, I mean, you name it, I, I you name it, there's generally a raw recipe for it. And I want to let everybody know, I'm going to put a link to uh, all of Doc's information below his website, his books and everything below. Now, okay. uh, so many questions for you. This is wonderful. Uh, and I'm really excited because I've been always, Lyme disease is, 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 is such a challenging one for people. For me personally, it's just one that, uh -huh. I don't, I mean, I've never had it, uh, but good, it's just good. one that I, I just think you could eat everything perfect, you could do everything great. And this little tiny bug could sting you or not can sting you. It's just, it's just crazy. I mean, but I'm glad to know you're here and uh, I'm going to recommend people to go to you to, uh, oh, thank for you. this uh, now. So tell us about, uh, besides these uh, her uh, herbal medications, where are you from a dietary standpoint on supplements? Uh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll be honest with you. I generally am not a big fan of them. I feel that if now, and again, I'm going to qualify this. If you have a very diverse, good raw diet, you don't need supplements, meaning vitamins and minerals, but I will be the first to say, and I got this from med school and I agree with this. Um, there are people who are so deficient when they come to me you know, magnesium, zinc, huge, huge is a, a big one. Zinc is huge, magnesium, calcium. They're so deficient in it that we have to boost them. We have to get them up to that plateau first. Then after they're there, it's okay. And uh, so it's, it's the type, for example, a lot of people take magnesium citrates or things of that nature. I'm very much against that. The only magnesium I believe in is, and there were trial studies done on it, is magnesium gluconate. Okay, it's much more assimilable by human beings. So I am, I generally feel that you don't need supplements unless you're kind of new to the diet. You're probably, you may already be very, very sick and we need to get you to that plateau first. And so one of my favorite protocols, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, is orthomolecular medicine. Okay, orthomolecular medicine, it was basically discovered by two psychologists back in the 1960s. Um, it's, and I'll use the term loosely, it's megadoses of mostly vitamins and, a, and one or two minerals. And it's meant to get you to where you need to be very, very quickly. It was basically discovered because of schizophrenic patients. And uh, they found out that B6... Um, was something that was missing from at least 50% of uh, schizophrenic patients. So they they went, okay, let's go ahead and give them the RDA. Didn't have any benefit. They gave them a megadose on it. And I have done this with schizophrenic patients. In four days, in four days when the orthomolecular medicine is done correctly, which means vitamins and minerals, very large doses, but done safely. In four days, the patients changed. They were America is one of the worst countries in the world for treating psychiatric disorders. You know, Prozac, 63 million prescriptions a year. So supplements have their place when the patient needs to get to a certain, you know, plateau first. Otherwise, I think once you're there and you have a good, healthy diet, you don't need them any longer. What about like vitamin B12? Uh, and Right. Okay, great. Great, because we know there's really two forms of vitamin B12. There's sure. a methylated and not. Um, there, there is a place for it. Uh, you you first want to make sure that the patient um, doesn't have a genetic issue. You want to make sure that uh, they don't have an intrinsic factor problem with their stomach. Um, it can have a temporary benefit. It can have a temporary benefit. Uh, in the long run, a lot of people don't know that there is a subset of bacteria in your gut that makes vitamin B12. And unfortunately, most Americans have a very, very poor uh, microbiome, you know, in their gut. It's very, very poor. 
uh, almost every patient that comes into our clinic, that comes into the practice that has um, a chronic disorder, almost without fail, every single one of them has candida, almost without fail, you know, a yeast overgrowth in their gut. Uh, an MD, a female MD I know of years ago, so it was nice to see an MD also recognize this. She even made the comment, 70% of her new patients that come through her door have candida, which is, the, like I said, a yeast overgrowth. And most of it, besides too much sugar and too much alcohol, most of it is due to the usage of antibiotics. And so your microbiome is already screwed up. And so, yeah, you have these people who are deficient in vitamin B12, they go to take it. Um, but again, it's valid until it's no longer valid, until it's no longer needed. And it's hard. It really is hard to get a patient to commit to a healthy diet and stay with it even after the program is over with. You know, the sad thing is in the 1990s, there was a federal mandate, a federal mandate that said all doctors, MD, OD, MD, doesn't matter, were to take courses on nutrition. To this day, 94% of U.S. physicians have taken zero credit hours in nutrition. So you've got me on one side going, you need to change your diet. And then you have on the other side, a vast number of MDs saying, no, diet has absolutely nothing to do with it. And so it's an uphill battle, but if, if you can get them there, eventually they don't have to take them anymore. Sure, sure. And so what do you take any supplements at all yourself? I actually, every so often, I will take magnesium gluconate if I've overworked myself physically because I like to do a lot of hiking and camping and things like that. And so magnesium gluconate is really nice as a muscle relaxer. But that's, that's about it. Okay. So what about uh, juicing? Do you Is juice uh, something you do? Absolutely love juicing. Absolutely love juicing. Again, if you refer back to the documentary Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, I highly recommend people who are curious to watch it. I think it's like free on Netflix and Amazon. This guy juiced for 60 days nonstop, didn't eat any solid food. One of the beauties of juicing <laughs> is that you get this massive influx of micronutrients without really having to digest it. So all the energy that would have gone into digesting goes into healing now. Sure. I'm big into juicing. I love juicing. And uh, I, I, I contribute as part of my success of being... Uh, 27 years, almost 28 years on a raw vegan diet. So uh, what type of juicer do you use? Just so curious. Oh, um, we basically call it a salad in a glass. Anything green along with carrots and a little bit of apple, a little bit of beet. But when my wife makes them, it's usually about three kinds of different lettuce, romaine, and it's got celery. Uh, we even put jalapeno in there. Sorry, are you blending it or juicing it? Juicing. Okay, what kind of juicer do you use? I mean, okay, we uh, many many years ago, and it's one I still recommend to patients that don't have a lot of money. Is the old Jack Lalane? It actually yeah. works. We beat the poop out of our old one for two years until it finally broke down. Then we moved to the Breville, and now we switched to the. I let's see if I get the name right. My wife has it. The Namo. Yeah. So I was going to say I've been Love using it. for years the Green Star juicer, which is the high, high, top quality. Juicer on the market is a Green Star juicer. However, uh, I just switched over to the Nama J2 juicer. That's Night ours. and day difference. Uh, and I, I love it. I absolutely love it. A matter of fact, I recommend it for everyone that's watching. I'm going to put a link with a coupon, a coupon code and a link below in the description for it. It just makes juicing. It takes it to another level and how easy it is to use. And, and oh. it's just wonderful. The big thing is my wife, we used the Breville for years and years, but it's a it's a wee bit difficult to clean. The Nama, <laughs> absolutely amazing. And it the pulp is actually dry on the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So tell yeah. me, as a man who's been on uh, seven years on a, a raw vegan diet, uh, right. and sounds like you know what you're doing, uh, uh, how much sleep do you get every night? <laughs> okay, that's great because I actually think about this quite often. The, <laughs> the more I got into the raw vegan diet, the less sleep I need. And so if I get six hours a night, I am just ready to go. Uh, I just, it's pretty much no matter what time I go to bed, whether it's 10, 11, 12, I get up about 5 30, 6 o'clock, ready to go. It's one of the things we try to explain to people that when your gut's clean, 
cleaned out. You know, you go through a nice detox like a candida. When you get the gut cleaned out, you get your microflora back to where it should be. You know, get it balanced because there's supposed to be about 1,400 different strains in there. And I just did two stool analysis on patients. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, yesterday we just did the results. And it shows so much micro different strains missing. And when they're missing, you don't assimilate this particular carb or this protein and so forth. So when the gut's cleaned out um, and you got your microflora in balance, it takes less food to get the same amount of nutrients you did before you went raw. So you need less food. Your energy is through the roof. Uh, my wife has compared me to Tigger from Winnie the Pooh because <laughs> the energy is so good. Yeah. And, and do you do you all have children? We do. They're all grown and out. And, and uh, are our, they into the healthy lifestyle at all? Our uh, Christopher, our son is, you know, he was a vegan. Then he got into a relationship that encouraged him to not be vegan. And now he's uh, now he's beginning to eat better again. But he's been watching me for years and seeing how dad doesn't get sick and so forth. Sure. Well, I, I know you're familiar with what I've done. And I've found out I wrote a book. I, I, to me, the quality of sleep determines just about everything. And sleeping Absolutely. is healing. And if Absolutely. you're eating and living the right way, you're going to get the sleep you need to heal in the right amount of time. If there's something wrong with your diet or your lifestyle on any level from stress to physical your sleep is going to not be where it should be. 100%. So uh, what I've discovered is if a person eats late at night and then goes to sleep, they're, they're not going to get the healing that naturally should take place during sleep. And I call it a daylight diet, uh, eating the food during the daytime hours or, and not eating late I at agree. night. So, yeah. So do you, when you tell people to go on a raw vegan diet, your patients and stuff, do you talk to them about the time they're eating their food? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, when you eat food, especially if you're not a raw vegan, um, it takes, okay, your body only every day produces so many enzymes. Okay. Another word for enzyme would be catalysts. These get processes started. You only make so much per day. And when you eat something, all right, it takes enzymes to begin the initial breakdown. So for example, in this hand, I hold a baked apple. In this hand, I hold a raw apple. All right. A baked apple has been heated, obviously, above 118 degrees. It's been well cooked. All the enzymes are dead. So when I bite into that raw, into that baked apple, it takes a little bit of my pool of, of uh, stored enzymes to break it down. If I eat this raw apple, it comes as a complete package. It has its enzymes already in it. I don't have to to use extensive from my raw from my pool of enzymes to do it. So it takes less energy to make it. So if I'm eating something that's especially not raw, and if I were to eat it at night, then that's energy going into that, which means it's energy not going into healing. It also stimulates the body, especially if you're not even a vegan. It causes extensive white blood cell count increase, inflammation. There were studies that showed that when you eat a especially an a non-vegan diet, your white blood cell count shoots up for about an hour. And we've seen blood tests on that. And it can happen with a vegan diet too, because, you know, there's so much processed food out there. You can be a bad vegan, you know, it's hard to be a bad raw vegan. No, it's know? not. I disagree with you on that one. Okay. Well, I suppose if you're not diverse <laughs> in what you're eating. Well, somebody could eat eight, uh, dates and dried fruit and nothing else all day. True. I mean True, and and, and I, I'm all for fruit, but definitely people can overdo the fruit, you know. Right. Uh, so there are a lot of bad vegan. Well, raw well vegans no, out there. no, I will agree with you. One of the mistakes I made early on in my being a raw vegan, and it is a common one, is too many nuts, That's too the, much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I give yeah. you that one. <laughs> You're <Yeah>. absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. So for me, what I found in my experience is, you know, the raw vegan diets you're going to improve in just about every area. But as you get into long term, you got to do something uh, to change your results. So for me, I mean, I had a, a ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and, and, and digestive right. issues. So for me, what I found is, and, and, and other people as well, as people were getting their blood tested, the, the bone density, which is, is, is become an issue for some long-term vegans. 
And what I have found, it's not diet because there's more than enough calcium and nutrients in the diet. Absolutely. What it is, as I found, is two things, lack of sleep and lack of uh, uh, strengthening exercises. And, well, and you I, have to stress the bones. You have yeah, to. Yes. And I find a lot of people, as they get into the raw vegan diet long term, they don't do do those strengthening exercises. They might jog or do yoga. Well, yoga can be, but you know, I'm talking about the muscle resistance exercise. For me, that's one of my keys to being successful at doing this long term. And even watching my blood work, I know if I if I went a while without it, I could see the difference. Stressing the bones or stressing the 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 muscles so important. Absolutely. Well, I had a patient yesterday. It was the very same thing. She I uh, was talking about her her weight and her stress levels. And she said that, uh, oh, I exercise. And her husband was sitting next to her laughing because uh, he's a major workout individual. And he said, no, you don't. You gently walk. And I said, it's true. If you don't get that cardio going, if you don't do resistance types things, then no, you're not going to burn the calories. You're not going to build the, the bone mass. A wonderful, you know, the China's, uh, uh, China story. study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that story, uh, f uh, Forks Over Knives. Americans take in more calcium than most people on this planet, but they don't eat a balanced diet and they don't do the exercise you're correct necessary to make the bones want to put it in there. Sure, sure. So what has been your experience with this? For me, I mean, I'm in a tropical environment and I grow most of my food or a good amount, but a lot of people don't have that opportunity. Right. But for me, what I've learned from Hippocrates Health Institute is sprouting foods, making those foods literally living foods. So sprouts are a big part of my diet. And I think anyone has the opportunity to just take some lentils or mug beans and just sprout them in a jar right on their countertop and throw them in their salad. And it makes a tremendous difference nutrition wise. Do you agree or disagree? Absolutely agree. You can literally have a garden in your kitchen. My wife and I love that. One of our favorites is broccoli sprouts. We absolutely love broccoli sprouts. I think sprouting is a great way. And again, easy to assimilate. You get a lot of cancer patients who have been on such a bad diet for so long, it's actually difficult for them to assimilate food. You know, it's cancer is a systemic failure of the body is what it is. So sprouts and juicing. Um, I've told patients that if they want to, I will walk them through. And if they were to do nothing but juice, not even solid food, just juice, they can heal. And I've seen remarkable results. Exactly. It's a rare exactly. patient to do that, but it happens. So now you're getting people, like you said, they're at the end of their line. They don't know what to do. And a lot of them are coming to you. So I know you also have a, a practice where you go to Ecuador and you help people out there. Guatemala. With, Guatemala. Guatemala. Guatemala, you help people out there. And so these are people that don't necessarily... They're not necessarily in the same situation as Americans that are coming to as a last resort. These are people just looking for any some form of health care they can get. How are they accepting the change in their diet and just the understanding of living a more natural lifestyle? And, and how does that compare to the average American that you deal with? That, that oh, other? gosh. Great question. Great question. Um, first of all, People in a lot of these areas of Latin America, their history is natural. Their history is um, there's there's almost no GMO food down there to start off with right off the bat because I'm in usually like a little remote village. And so they don't even have that. They grow their own corn. They make their own tortillas. Now, the problem with the older generation is that all they know is frijoles, you know, beans and tortillas, you know, and some corn. Uh, and if you ask them, did you have any fruit today? No, they don't. Because unfortunately, uh, uh, over 75% of the population in Guatemala live below the poverty line from what we consider the poverty line. So for them, buying fruit can be expensive, um, even though it's very, very, very cheap to live down there compared to in America. The children are are and the young adults are coming along a lot faster and it part of it is is that their history is they prefer natural medicine so i was extremely well accepted uh, it was it was just it's been a great gift uh, and honor how much they've accepted me and um, i actually every time i go down i take a lot of natural medicine with me and we do it all for free for the patients and uh, 
we've seen great success, even when it came to psych psychiatric type issues. There's a lot of depression and anxiety down there because of the poverty. But because their history is natural, they're much more open. They're much more open minded to it than Americans are, <laughs> to be honest. Sure. Wow. Wow. So with what you're doing, uh, tell us about some of the success stories you had here in the United States with people that doctors kind of gave up on. You put them on his diet. Tell us about some of the success stories. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and give you a couple here real quick. And again, not trying to push the book, but you can always get it. It's called Case Histories of a Successful Naturopathic. How many, how many books have you written? About six. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to put the link below the videos to those. Okay, and, I'll help you. So tell okay, us, I'll tell, go ahead, tell us what you're going to say. So. Okay, so for example, we had one patient. Uh, she she originally came to us that uh, she had, her and her husband came into the clinic, they had psoriasis. All right, there's an autoimmune skin condition. All right, we treat it. We've been very successful with it. But she said while she was sitting there with her husband in the office, this is during their initial intake, intake she said, would you check this too before we leave? And she said, there's a little lump on my, on my right lower abdominal. And so I said, sure. So we finished the intake. It was an hour appointment, about 45 minutes into it. I said, okay, we'll treat you for the psoriasis. Let's go in the exam room and let's check out what you got. So we went in there, her and her husband and I went in. And as soon as I touched it, I knew because I've been around a lot of, a lot of cancer. And as soon as I touched it, I knew what it was. But, you know, you keep that poker face because she's watching my face so carefully. And I said, you know what? Because we do ultrasound, we do EKGs, we do our own, a lot of our own lab work. I said, you know what? Let's let me ultrasound you real quick. We didn't charge her for it. I said, let's just look. And so she's looking at the screen, and I'm. And I said, see all this? That's not supposed to be there. Her, her abdominal cavity was packed, was just packed with cancer. And I said, okay. So she's starting to get a little nervous, and I'm trying to explain to her this is not supposed to be there. Before we use the C word, let's go ahead and order some blood work. And it came back raging. So the reason she asked me to check that spot is because her previous doctor had just poked and said, oh, it's just a fatty deposit. So she got mad. She got very angry. She ran back to him and started going off on him going, I have cancer. And he freaked out. He reran all my tests and went, oh, you got cancer. And it was, and he had said it was just a fatty deposit. Ended up staging it at four, stage four. Um, I have a rule that when I treat patients with those types of issues, I don't talk them out of whatever their other doctor decides. That's between them and me, them and, you know, between them yeah. and their other doctor. I said, I tell patients, if you're a cancer patient and you're on chemo or radiation, I will not work with you because it's a losing battle. Uh, Australia did a study that found out that only of all chemotherapy, only 5% is successful with it. I said, once you're done, Come back to me. I'll work with you. I will work with you if you want to do surgery for debulking, and but not radiation or or chemo. Come back afterwards. She chose to to work with us, and um, we worked with her. She was wonderful. She went raw vegan. She went completely raw vegan. They told her she had six months to live. Well, here we are. We're uh, six seven years down the road. It went it went from stage four to zero. And uh, it was it was a great blessing to be able to work with her and see that happen. Yes, we used Thunder God Brute. We used uh, holistic medications. We used Dr. F Christopher's protocols. Uh, wonderful naturopathic doctor. And uh, but uh, uh, the diet and attitude attitude is is, is absolutely gigantic. Uh, you can get sick just by living a dark enough life. You know, long enough. It will. It's been proven. Uh, the psychoneural uh, medicine. So that's one example of how successful it's been, the diet plus the meds. I've seen what you're talking about and uh, it, it just works and it's satisfying when people listen and they, they reap the benefit of it, you know, but it's also, I know so hard for you because there are so many people that, that don't do it and, 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 and you know, they could be successful, but they just, they just. Well, on the, on the negative side, I had a patient who uh, we found that she had um, colon cancer. And uh, I said, okay. And so she and her and her husband had been patients for years, but then now we found out, you know, off and off her little things, but now we've, because her diet was absolutely horrendous. And I said, okay. She, she said, okay, I want to go under the program. I said, okay, well, your first thing is a candy to cleanse. She said, no. She had one reason why she would not do the candy to cleanse. 
she would not give up cheesecake, <laughs> would not give up cheesecake. She went to another doctor and she died She because she just would not change her diet. Wow. wow. And to me, that's one of those Christian things. It's just a bobble. It's just a glass bead. You, you know, you, as my dad used to say, do you live to eat or eat to live? You know, what's more yeah. important? Yeah. You know, another case real quickie for you, case story, Lyme disease. It's actually one of my one of my specialties is Lyme disease. It's an incredible, incredibly destructive, but fascinating disease. It literally is the HIV of bacteria, you know, versus virus. Sure. And uh, here on the Western United States, I'm one of only three that I'm aware of. And I know there's probably others of uh, Lyme literate doctors that, that, that we were one of only three Lyme literate clinics at the time that treated Lyme. And it's sad that most doctors don't understand it. They don't recognize it. They don't have to test for it. And uh, so real quickly for you, one patient came out of Medford, Oregon. She'd had Lyme. She was actually correctly diagnosed with it. Her other doctor could not work with her. She could, he couldn't cure her. So she came to us and within about three months, she was showing, and not this is not kudos to me. This is just the way we're designed. She was showing such great results that her doctor asked to be schooled by us to teach him how to treat it. And what did we do? Natural medications, lifestyle choices, and diet. The more raw, first of all, you have to be vegan. And the more raw vegan you are, the faster you heal. A big Absolutely. point is alkalinizing the body, getting the body to go alkaline. And what's your been success rate with the limes? What's been your success? We've had one hundred percent success rate with it, as long as the patient followed the program. We've had patients that showed up. I'm going to give you an example. We had patients, one that showed up and was spending seven, has spent seventy thousand dollars on their on their Lyme treatments, and insurance generally doesn't pay for it. And what they do is they just massively dose them with a cocktail of antibiotics. But Lyme knows this, and it will actually go into what's called a cyst stage. It'll go to sleep kind of like herpes does in the spine it'll, or in the tissues, and it'll wait until you're done. And then it'll eventually, a year or two later, it'll pop back out and start back all over again with its uh, collateral damage that it does. Um, but we... If they, if the patient follows the program, if they, if they do the diet and uh, they do the medications, people who are spending seventy thousand dollars a month, our Lyme program, and I'll admit, it's the most expensive program we have because one other doctor I know of, and he was correct, he said Lyme's actually harder to cure than cancer is, and yet our Lyme program is something like around three hundred fifty dollars a month. That's it. And that includes your visit. Once now, how long does it take when somebody starts working with you usually till they see the results? Great question. They usually start seeing, okay, now this is a careful caveat. They start feeling better within the first month, okay, but that's not a cure. Chronic Lyme. And unfortunately, that's what we get most of the time. Out of all the, the decades I've been doing this, I've had two cases of acute Lyme, meaning they just got bit within the past three months. Unfortunately, because most people are misdiagnosed, and uh, they, they're told it was just a fever. You don't know you have Lyme until it's usually been 10, 15, 20 years down the road when it's already done such massive damage to the body. So the average patient is probably going to be about a year. It usually takes about a year. So is there a test, a particular one particular test? You say, let me test you to see if you have Lyme. So there's two tests. There are two tests. And this is one of the great, the wonderful question, Paul. This is one of the great errors by doctors who are not trained in Lyme. They will order what's called the Western blot reflex, a worthless test, worthless. It's really cheap. And so the insurance companies will pay for that, but that's about it. It's a worthless test. It almost always comes up with a false negative, almost always. So I learned uh, from Dr. Burrascano. He was the, you know, I learned from his protocols. He was the, at the time, the world's leading Lyme doctor. He treated over 11,000 patients worldwide. There are two tests that he recommends, and I do those tests. It's the Western blot serum and the CD57. The CD57 detects the our immune cells, and they drop just like the CD4 does for HIV. And AIDS patients. So the CD57, very important, and the Western blot serum. And then you have to have a doctor who knows how to read them correctly. And so wow. we will run those through, you know, say every two to three months throughout their program to monitor where their immune levels are at. Because like I said, I easily call Lyme 
the the HIV or the AIDS of uh, bacteria. Now, was bacteria. is your Lyme test? Uh, I mean, your Lyme protocol. Like I know you said, cancer. They have to. They have to be one hundred percent raw vegan. Is that for your Lyme patients as well, or vegan is good enough for your patients? Okay, they have to be vegan, and I encourage them highly that the more raw they are, the faster they heal. Okay, now you were saying Lyme's, uh, like herpes, can hide and come back later on. It's called the so, cyst stage. So when the person gets better after working with you for a year, can their body completely get rid of the Lyme, or is it just yes. depressed when you're eating healthy? No, uh, okay, <laughs> great question, because it would appear so. But that's why we run the CD57. A lot of doctors make the mistake that when they start treating Lyme patients, they'll give them massive, massive um, antibiotic cocktail for about three months and go, you're cured. Okay, well, that's not the way it works. It can take six months to a year easily. And what we do is we use the CD57. The CD57, when you have Lyme, the numbers drop, drop, drop. When they're below like, uh, when it's when it's below 200, Okay, we don't know for sure. When it's below 120, we're pretty sure you have Lyme. When it's below 60, you've got raging Lyme. So what we do is they do this, they do the Lyme program until they hit 200. You're 200, it's gone. And we have years and years of history that if they will do it till they're 200, it never comes back again. Even if they go back to a bad lifestyle? Even if they go back to a bad lifestyle, the only the only caveat would be now that's a great question because we we have a lot of cancer patients and Lyme lupus and MS and and rheumatoid arthritis and they come in and they go if I do your program will I be forever cured and I go probably not for example type one diabetes almost all humans on Earth have some genetic propensity towards some weakness. For example, in type 1 diabetes, it's your beta cells on your pancreas. You're attacking your own beta cells because they're the weakest of the cells that you've got in your particular case. All right. So you ate a bad diet. You had a bad lifestyle. You got type 1 diabetes. We work with you. We're blessed. You get better because of what you're doing, because you heal yourself. You get better. And then we say we have a thing we call, we say it's graduation. You're done. You're boring, go away. <laughs> we want you to be boring so you don't have to spend money on doctors for the rest of your life. And we just, we tell them, if you go back to the old lifestyle, the very thing that helped encourage this condition to occur, yes, you will probably get it again. Now, Lyme's different. Lyme, you have to be bitten by most likely, though there is now a pretty good evidence now that is also sexually transmitted because it looks actually, actually looks like uh, syphilis bacteria. If you go back to your old diet, but you don't get bit by the tick again, you probably will not, you'll probably not get Lyme again, unless you're with a mate that does have Lyme. Because there is, like I said, mounting yeah. evidence. It's not just the deer tick. It's a good, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a great movie called Under Your Skin. Love it's it. Great, <laughs> great movie. Great movie. I actually interviewed the author of that. On Ooh, show. nice, nice. Yeah, it was wonderful. And and it's very interesting about the sexually transmission of it. It's it's absolutely evidence that shows that. So let me ask you, so like herpes, is that yes. like limes where a person can get rid of it or does it truly live in a body forever like they suggest? Great, because now we're talking about a viral infection. And yes, they will actually go to sleep to, uh, again, chicken pox to shingles. We've had uh, multiple cases. I'm going to give you a great case here. And this when you say go heart. to sleep, though, when you say go to sleep, they'll okay, not go they, on, just sleep. Okay, but we don't work with it that way. Okay. okay. The reason they go to sleep is because the immune system is kicked in and um, they can actually reside within the tissues, mostly within the spinal column. And they're, they're, there's not a whole lot of good antiviral prescription drugs out there. There are not. But there are excellent historically herbal medications that have been shown to be very effective against viruses. A good example, my father-in-law, he's passed now, but my father-in-law, he, he originally came to me. Uh, we didn't get along too well. I loved him, but I was that foreigner who came in and took their Southern daughter away from him. <laughs> and we helped him through. He had a 90% heart block in his heart and his cardiologist wanted to do open heart surgery on him. He asked if he could get uh, a, go talk to his other doctor, his son-in-law. And the other doctor said, because who wants to crack open a 74-year-old? And he says, I'll give you three months, but you're having surgery in three months. So Virgil calls me, my, myself and my wife, Peggy, his daughter, and we say, because we knew 
they were from Alabama, old country folk, and pretty much fried food three times a day. We knew they weren't going to change their diet. So we said, look, if you will just do this, and we told them a special way to use for ex- apple cider vinegar, all right, Bragg's being my favorite. And he did what we asked him to do. It was a very concerted effort. He had to do this four times a day, six days a week, month after month. And in three months, he went back to his cardiologist for surgery. They re-examined him and he went from a 90% block to zero. He completely cleared it out. So I went from being that foreigner to them going around church saying, my son-in-law, the doctor. (laughs) Well, that took us to the virus, the herpes, in this case, the shingles. He was about 76 at this point now, and he calls and he says, will you please come help me? And we hadn't seen him in about, so it had been about six weeks. And he said, when so we grabbed a medical bag, he said, I have shingles. And he said his other doctor had tried for six weeks to cure him and couldn't. Shingles usually at its worst usually only lasts about 30 days and it goes away, but it didn't resolve itself. Again, a horrible immune system, horrible diet. We show up and he's sitting in what's called Papa's chair. You know, they usually wear ball caps. He couldn't. He had shingles literally from his scalp to his feet. He was, it was horrendous. He was sitting in the chair with his hand and his, you know, his face in his hands. Absolutely miserable. Six weeks of, I don't know if you've ever had shingles before. No. But my understanding, I haven't either, but my understanding from pain, it's horrendously painful yeah. and, and uncomfortable. So we only took two things. We only took two things for him. We took a special little tincture we make that has cayenne and uh, myrrh and golden seal. Okay. And the cayenne, of course, also. And we told him just topically rub this multiple times a day throughout the, over the shingles. And then we said golden seal capsules. We had him take a pretty significant dose of golden seal. We said, you're going to be taking it for weeks. He called us the next morning and said, I'm already feeling better. In one week, the shingles were gone. And it never came back for the rest of his life. It never came back with him, even though he had this horrible diet and so forth and so on. So it actually killed it. I've had patients with Epstein-Barr, a beautiful example. Epstein-Barr, they'll say is incurable. That's why a lot of doctors won't even attempt. First of all, they run the wrong test. Two, they won't even, they'll they'll flat told me, I won't even run the test because it's incurable. So why do we care? It is very curable. It's a serious virus. And uh, I had this one woman, she was... uh, late 40, 40s, early 50s. And she ran that kind of business, you know, the kind when you walk around the grocery store and they serve you samples. So the grocery store will hire this company to come in for the day and serve the food that they want to to pedal, to push. Well, she did this, but Epstein-Barr is, in, it's a level of fatigue all its own. It's incredibly crippling. And she said, I'm going to lose my business. And so we went and treated her. It took about five months because she had a very severe case and it was gone. She was back to getting up at five o'clock in the morning. Her business, her continue, continue. Now Epstein to do Barr is that, that's not like a, a virus. I mean, it's more it's like mononucleos- a brain- mononucleosis. So it's is another a, word for it. Okay. So but it's, it's like a, adrenal fatigue. I mean, uh, leaves the it's, symptoms it's the off. Fatigue is even beyond adrenal fatigue. You are yeah. correct, but it's yeah. even beyond that. It's most people on this planet get Epstein Barr. When you're a child, you get this bad fever and it goes away and it comes out just like shingles later in life when your immune system is suppressed, you're under a lot of stress, you had surgery. So it's, it's so it what about be, the people like they go on a raw diet, right? They get better. They had shingles or herpes, they get better, but they're still on the raw diet. And because what they tell me is they say, well, I still have breakouts, but nowhere near like I used to. Correct. Absolutely correct. Because what they've done is they've boosted their immune system up. Um, so that it doesn't, like cold sores, a good example of another herpes type virus. With patients, before they change their diet, they would have breakouts a lot. After they changed their diet, it got to be where the breakouts were very, very small. It's because the diet vastly improved your immune system, but you still didn't go after the virus itself. And once you do, once you change your diet, and you go impact the virus itself directly. I've seen great success, and I've seen them where they don't come back. Okay, okay. And right, right going after the virus, you talk about the herbs and stuff. Exactly, exactly. But again, part of the equation is the diet. The body, I tell patients that part of the reason for the diet is I want the body partaking in the healing. I want the body to be doing part of the job. And um, if you just give somebody... I don't care whether it's prescription medication or herbal medication, and that's all you do. They're going to feel better, but the probability of a complete cure is pretty minimal. 
Sure. Because we weren't designed to eat the stuff that is being fed to people today. So, yeah. So on my raw vegan diet, doing great, better from Crohn's disease, colitis. Uh, I tried going back after doing this for like eight to 10 years to raw goat milk and raw eggs and started to have stomach problems again. Absolutely. Stop that and then better. I had a young lady. She was about 20, 21 years old. Serious, serious Crohn's disease. I mean, she was bleeding, you know, her stools. It was, it was quite severe. The, 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 the abdominal cramping, it was very severe. You know, the other doctors were wanting to give her, you know, immune suppressants and yada, yada, yada. She came to me and uh, we treated her and within one month, I think within two weeks, the pain started to subside. After one month, the pain was gone. But of course, she still had Crohn's. We treated her for about a total of three months. She showed no signs of the Crohn's disease anymore. And what was the sad thing she did? <laughs> One of the last things she did when she came into the office, she came in and said, okay, when can I start having pork and eggs again? <laughs> and I told her, I said, you care. can't <laughs> because yeah. this is your genetic propensity. This and, is what you- And that's what I'm saying, inherited weakness, genetic propensity. It, it's, it's even if you're great for years. It, Absolutely. It, it, you got it. Like now, when you were talking about type one and type two di diabetes, now this is different because is type two we know is diet related one hundred percent, but type one is this more something? Uh, is it as well diet? Okay, is... great, great question. Okay, autoimmune. Okay, under standard conventional modern day medicine, the term they they say, oh, the immune system is going crazy because you're attacking whatever particular cells are associated with that disorder. Okay, but here's the, here's the thing. The immune system is working perfectly. That's why I despise when they remove the thymus gland because they're going, oh, we're going to shut the immune system down or put them on Imuran or prednisone. If, if my hand is a cell, let's just say this is a cell, on the surface of every cell is a little flag. It's a little protein marker, but it's a little flag. And that little flag is telling your body, it's me, don't eat me, I'm part of you. In every autoimmune condition that exists, that cell, that particular, like the beta cells or whatever, that flag is missing. The cell is damaged. It may still be producing insulin, but the cell is damaged and the flag isn't there. So the immune system thinks it's not self anymore and it takes it out. So our job is to help you regrow happy cells again with the flags. Again, here's a great example, the BRCA gene, okay, with uh, breast cancer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's one of my pet peeves. I've had so many women come in because we've we've worked with a lot of breast cancer in the past and they'll come in and they'll go, oh, yeah, you know, I was tested with the, you know, I was positive on the BRCA gene. So I went and had my breasts removed. All right. Healthy breasts. First of all, what the other doctor is not telling him is there is actually there are actually numerous cells that are somewhat associated with a higher risk of breast cancer. And I tell them, especially the ones that come in and they haven't done it yet. They haven't gotten the breasts removed yet. They go, well, my mom had it, my aunt had it, my grandmother had it. They all had their breasts removed because they all got breast cancer. And I go, just because you have a genetic propensity towards something does not mean you will ever get it. If you choose the lifestyles they did, yes, the probability is much higher you will. But if you don't live that lifestyle, there's a good probability you won't ever have that issue. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So- uh, this is such great information. It's so important. So uh, I want, I'm going to put all your contact information below in some links. Everybody uh, contact Doc here and he's going to take care of you. And uh, I'm definitely uh, recommending uh, him to uh, anyone that's dealing with any issues and uh, the links below. And uh, uh, I, I thank you so much for, for sharing uh, what you shared and come on here. And I definitely want to have you back on the show as a guest again. So everybody put your questions below and we'll ask them next time uh, he's on. Uh, I'm thank just you. wonderful information. And I thank you so much for sharing, for sharing all of this. Oh, it's, it was an honor. Thank you for doing it. Uh, my, I've always had a cliche that I can touch one patient today, meaning treat one patient today, or I can teach a hundred in the same day. Treating a patient is important, but it's so important that we teach people how to take care of themselves so they don't have to spend money on doctors. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being here. The website and the link is below. Definitely uh, uh, contact uh, this doctor and everything he's doing and uh, is wonderful. And I'm really excited to get his information out there and help 
uh, you connect with him. So the information is below. Thank, Thank you, you again, Doc. Yes. Thank you too for what you do. Nature's wealth, good for your health. This is the Raw Life Health Show. Nature's wealth, good for your health. This is the Raw Life Health Show. Nature's wealth, good for your health. This is the Raw Life.